A uh, very good morning to Professor Mehta and uh, Dr. Dinesh Kohler, and a very good morning to all of you. And before I begin, I would just like to express my sincere gratitude to Dr. Rajasekara, to Dr. Mehta for this very kind invitation to this uh, wonderful meeting. And uh, I, I, I feel privileged to to kind of kickstart this meeting with the first talk, uh, which uh, is basically going to be on access and membrane uh, and circuit pressures. Uh, these are my disclosures. And the basic agenda of my talk is going to be talking a bit about the vascular access, how we would choose an access type, site, and tip position, uh, commonly used membranes in CKRT and their characteristics, and a bit of outline of the CKRT circuit. So uh, why, why are we talking about access? We all know that vascular access is the Achilles heel of CKRT. And then dysfunctional access is associated with shorter filter life and consequently may decrease the dose of CKRT delivered and increase the utilization of resources. For example, this study from Samson identified that the mean access pressure in late artificial kidney failure was about 7.5 millimeter mercuries less negative than early failing circuits uh, and, and the pressures demonstrated a lower variability. In addition, the vascular access that demonstrated access dysfunction had shorter filter lives. And this is something that we all see in our clinical practice. So this cartoon essentially shows the various vascular access options that are available for CKRT. The most frequently utilized access are non-tunnel non dialysis catheters uh, and in patients where renal recovery is maybe delayed for more than two to three weeks, a cuff tunnel dialysis catheter should be considered. Alternately, there would be patients who are already having some other form of access support. And, and uh, the typical example would be those patients who are on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And in such scenarios, uh, integrating the CKRT with ECMO and avoiding a catheter insertion in a patient who is already on heparin anticoagulation appears to be a viable option. There are reports, especially from Michigan, where they have used an existing AVF uh, and uh, Though this, this has been used, but it is not something that we would be routinely doing in an acute care setting. Now, in planning for a vascular access, several factors need to be considered, which have been highlighted in this slide. And the choice of catheter, the technique of insertion, the site of insertion, the position of the tip of the catheter in the vein, and which all these factors, they interplay with the patient's characteristics and uh, the access care maintenance protocols. And a co a combination of these factors would essentially probably give us an access for CKRT success. So when it comes down to the choice of catheter material, the stiffness and thrombogenicity are key considerations, and the polyurethane catheters are the most commonly used as they are rigid enough to allow bedside insertion, and once in the vein, their thromboplasticity softens them to minimize the risk of vein thrombosis or, or vein trauma. The tunnel catheters, which are usually made of silicon, are soft and much less thrombogenic, allowing prolonged use. And therefore, these are probably used for patients where we do not anticipate kidney injury to happen in the near future. Now, with regards to the shape of the catheter lumen uh, and the catheter tape, they also have a bearing on the resistance and recirculation characteristics. So the cycle C shaped lumen and uh, a step tip design or a shotgun catheter are their preferred catheter designs. The cycle C essentially being because they do not have any sharp edges and the ratio of the catheter lumen to the diameter is the largest. And with regards to shotgun tips where there is at least about two to three centimeters between the, the access port and the return port, they minimize the recirculation that may happen, which would in, a, in, a, in the longer run uh, kind of uh, uh, have a bearing on the dose of CKRT delivered. Now, another important consideration when choosing access is the size or the diameter of the access. Now, if you were to regard blood as a Newtonian fluid, the, the flow may be defined by the Poisson equation and is directly proportional to the fourth power of the radius and inversely proportional to the length. So in, in catheters where a doubling of the length would decrease the, the flow by half, 
uh, increase in the diameter by about 19% would double the flow and they kind of uh, negate each other and they compensate for each other. However, we have to be wary that an oversized catheter in a vein may itself cause blood flow deceleration and stasis of blood flow and increase the risk of thrombosis. In fact, there are studies, and especially in cancer patients, where the risk, where the ratio between the catheter and the vein, if it was more than 0.45, this was associated with increased risk of vein thrombosis. And this is, has been experimentally shown in this study where for any given uh, blood flow, the larger gauge catheters of more than 13 French had significantly lower resistances as compared to small gauge catheters of 13 French, or lesser than 13 French. And therefore, in practice, most of us would use catheters in the range of about 11 to 14 French, and I think 12 to 13 French is probably the sweet spot for CKRT catheters. Now, in, in clinical practice, the role of catheter size was highlighted when CKRT dose delivered was analyzed in patients who received a femoral access in the renal study. While the femoral access was associated with a 1% odd decrease in the dose of CKRT delivered, the use of a 13.5 French catheter was associated with a 4.2% higher dose delivery. The, the other part to, to remember again, if we were to think of blood as a Newtonian fluid, would be that fluids in a linear channel would flow in a la which uh, would demonstrate a laminar flow. But however, if the path is curved or they come across a bend, the flow becomes turbulent and the flow decreases. And therefore, how the catheter traverses through the tissues to reach the target site may have a bearing on the flow velocity. Now, with regards to upper body catheters, uh, a major problem is correctly citing the catheter in the absence of reliable landmarks. In addition, for catheters inserted on the left side, once it encounters a sharp bend, the catheter must be passed a reasonable distance beyond the bend so that the axis of the catheter and the vein are, are aligned. Now, in the thorax, three possible zones have been identified to allow appropriate positioning of the catheter tip. The zone A, which involves the lower superior vena cava and the, the, the upper part of the right atrium, uh, is, is uh, suggested for the left-sided catheters so that their tips will align to the vein wall uh, in, in, in the superior vena cava. Zone D describes the upper part of superior vena cava and is suitable for right-sided IJ catheters. And zone C, uh, C should be avoided for dialysis catheters, especially left-sided catheters, as the angle to the vertical of the catheter to the vein would be greater than 40 degrees, which would probably increase the risk of complications of catheter like perforation. So a clinical example is, is shown in this slide. So if you look at the picture on the left, the right-sided uh, IJ catheter, which lies in zone B, and the left-sided IJ catheter lies in zone A. And as is evident on the uh, accompanying CT, the left-sided catheter lies parallel to the SVC wall, and therefore this will minimize the risk of trauma. And again, there was, again, in the clinical practice, a, a randomized study where the tip of the left IJ catheter was in zone B, just past the zone C. Uh, sorry, uh, 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 where they did actually a study wherein they randomized 100 patients to receive soft silicon catheters, which were longer for the tip to reach the right atrium versus catheters which were shorter, where they did not reach the right atrium. And the use of longer catheter was associated with significantly improved filter life, greater delivered dose of dialysis, and less circuits discontinued due to vascular access issues. The slight increase in the, left, uh, in the risk of atrial arrhythmias was not significant in this study. With regards to femoral catheters, it is recommended that their tips lie in the, I, in the inferior vena cava, and the right and left IJ veins join at the level of about lumbar 5 vertebra, which may be used as a kind of a landmark to, to uh, assess where the tip of the catheter is. So as is apparent from what we have discussed, the site of catheter insertion and the target position of the tip uh, will determine the length of the catheter to be used. Uh, 
There are various formulae out there, but not all of them have been the most reliable. And the KDGO guidelines do suggest uh, a certain uh, uh, size of a catheter depending on what is going to be the site of insertion of catheters. Important to remember in, in average size or big size adults, the left IJ catheter should preferably be 20 cm and uh, and the right side, uh, the femoral catheter should be at least about 24 to 25 centimeters. Now, there would be situations in clinical practice where we have all the access sites available to us, which is a, a rather rare in, in the ICU settings. But in this type of catheters, which would be your preferred site, an IJ catheter or a femoral catheter? Now, the Cathedia study, which and its accompanying studies do provide us certain insights into how we would make our choice with, the, with regards to these catheters. So with regards to central line associated bloodstream infections, in patients in the Cathedia trial, in patients who had a BMI of more than 28.4, the femoral access was associated with a greater risk of infection. In patients with, with a BMI of less than 24.2, the IJ catheters were associated with a greater risk of catheter-related bloodstream infections. And this observation should be borne in mind when we are choosing the site of insertion, assuming we have a choice of where we could insert the catheter. Now, with regards to catheter dysfunction and dialysis performance between the right IJ and left IJ and femoral catheters, the risk of dysfunction was significantly increased when left IJ catheters as compared to right IJ or femoral catheters. Therefore, when available, uh, if we had to make a choice between a left IJ catheter or a femoral catheter, I would probably personally prefer to put in a femoral catheter, uh, which is sufficiently long enough. Now, there was another study, uh, again, coming out from the Cathedia trial. They looked at 134 patients who had two catheters inserted, and one catheter in being in the jugular vein and the other catheter being in the femoral vein. And when they looked at these catheters with, in, 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 uh, in response or to catheter dysfunction or the risk of developing infection because of catheter insertion, there was no difference between a jugular vein catheter or a femoral vein catheter. So all in all, the, the jugular and femoral vein appear to function equally well, uh, except in the extremes of BMI, or if they are too, uh, if it's more than 28, then obviously the, the jugular vein catheter may outperform the femoral catheter. So how do I, if I was to make a decision-making algorithm for catheters, so how do I go about that? So the first question is, of course, I need a vascular access for CKRT. The question I ask is, is there an existing vascular access? If the answer is yes, or the answer is no. If there is an existing vascular access, is it if it's a tunnel vascular access with the tip well positioned in the right atrium, that will be my to go to access. If this patient has an alternate access because they, he's already or she's already on ECMO, then I would probably integrate my CKRT circuit with the ECMO circuit and we will be discussing some of these connections a bit later in this, in this meeting. The AVF and AVG is there maybe for the sake of conclusion, uh, uh, for completion, but uh, we have used AVFs in, in people with CRT for durations of up to 18 hours to 20 hours, which we have published in the AKRT meeting in Malaysia a couple of years ago. Uh, we presented, sorry, but this is not something that we would routinely do. Of course, if there is no vascular access, then we have to plan, plan for an ultrasound-guided insertion of a non-cuff, non-tunnel catheter. And of course, we would need to take into account multiple uh, uh, factors, uh, for example, the need for long-term dialysis, the emergency and operator experience, presence of coagulopathy, presence of compartment pressures, etc. Now, once we have this and then depending on what is the site and looking at other factors or patient factors like the BMI, uh, the require for, uh, requirement for ambulation or rehabilitations, uh, the presence of a tracheostomy, presence of a neck surgery, uh, we, we would probably choose between a right IJ catheter, a femoral catheter, and a left IJ catheter. Now, 
If you look at the various studies that have recently come out and we look at their vascular access patterns, uh, there is almost a 50-50 distribution between IJ catheters and femoral catheters. And when we audit our data at, at our hospital, our uh, 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 choices of catheter insertion are pretty similar. Now, one part is, of course, the insertion, the choice of catheter, the insertion, and where would you choose, which I think is a very important component. But equally important is how do we maintain these catheters in these patients? Uh, because there would be certain complications that would be associated with either catheter uh, this, uh, uh, insertion, which could be trauma to the vessel, the pneumothorax, or a hematoma, etc., which will, uh, of course, or compromise the functioning of these catheters and there would be early catheter dysfunction which would happen soon after a catheter is inserted which is generally due to a malposition of kinking or formation of an intraluminal thrombosis and then in the longer term of course we need to have uh, protocols in place to minimize the risk of infection and there are certain protocols that have been known to work and especially uh, uh, hand hygiene, use of aseptic precautions while inserting, using chlorhexidine as, as the uh, antiseptic or uh, uh, sterilizing a, uh, antiseptic agent when we are inserting the catheters. And based on this, the, uh, the KDGO guidelines in 2012 did recommend their choices of catheter in, uh, sites and insertions depending on what is available to us. Now, switching from catheters to, to membranes, uh, we, we know over a period of time, the membrane technology has evolved from initial cellulose and modified cellulose membranes to the current synthetic membranes, which are basically alloys and copolymers of more than one non-cellulosic polymer. And then depending on these copolymers used, we have an array of synthetic membranes that are used in dialysis. Now, as is evident in the cartoon, the synthetic membranes uh, have different structures and uh, different capabilities that affect the solute clearance, uh, more so for the middle and larger molecules uh, and weight substances. For example, the synthetic membrane uh, polyacrylonitrile and the polymethylmethacrylate have greater adsorptive capacity than synthetic membranes like polysulfone. Now, here is the diagram diagrammatic display of how membranes are manufactured and, and by running a core and a polymer solution through a spinneret and then precipitating, washing, and after treating the membrane to control its integrity and, pore and, and uh, dimensions. And depending on the polymer solution used and the core solution used and modifications in the manufacturing process, uh, we can influence the pore size, the pore density, and the pore size distribution of this membrane. And these are important characteristics that affect the ultrafiltration and the solute clearance capability of the membranes. So consequently, the molecular weight retention onset, which defines the molecular weight at which we reach a sieving coefficient of 0.9, uh, or for the membrane has moved to the right and the slope between the molecular weight retention onset and the molecular weight cutoff has become steeper and implying that we are able to clear more solutes of larger molecular weights without adversely influencing albumin loss. An example of, of these membranes um, uh, are the high cutoff membranes that, that were used uh, and I shall uh, just show you an example of a clinical study. Uh, so, of course, high cutoff membranes were initially used for sepsis. Uh, unfortunately, not many studies showed a reliable positive outcome. But there are high cutoff membranes that are used for myoglobin clearance, uh, which are better and they perform better than standard cutoff membranes. So, in this study, they, they uh, kind of randomized patients to receive a CVVHDF with a medium cutoff membrane, the MIG2 membrane, which has a molecular weight cutoff of about 30 kilodaltons, uh, or 45 kilodaltons, versus a standard high flux membrane. And they were able to show better myoglobin clearance uh, with, with this membrane. Now, another property of the membrane that has been leveraged upon is adsorption. Now, adsorption is limited by the adsorptive surface and hence it is a saturable process. 
And this was elegantly demonstrated in this study uh, many years ago, uh, where there was a progressive decline in the cytokine removal over uh, 12 hours of the use of this membrane. And upon changing the hemofilter, the clearances improved significantly before they began to decline again in the next 12 hours. So the hydrophobic symmetric membranes like polyacrylonitrile and PMMA mem membranes have a higher adsorptive capability and therefore may be used to affect cytokine clearance. The CKRT hemofilters they, using these membranes are termed as cytokine adsorbing filters and as has been shown in this study, the capacity of a, 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 a cytokine adsorbing membrane like AN69 surface treated membrane, especially for a, a upstream a mediator molecule like uh, HMBG1 is much more than other such membranes. And an extension of this AN69 membrane has been the oxiris membrane, which is uh, which essentially the negative charge of the native polymer polyacrylonitrile, which is conferred by the methyl sulfonate, uh, generated bradykinin upon contact with blood. And therefore, a partial coating of this membrane was done with a uh, with a cationic polyethylene amine to reduce this bradykinin uh, activation. But when they manufacture the oxiris membrane, they use three times the, the amount of polyethylenamine and 10 times the amount of heparin. And therefore, at these amounts, these become biologically active. And these membranes have a capacity to absorb both cytokines and endotoxins. However, data on their clinical usage and influencing outcomes is yet is still awaited. And in my last slide, I just give you a schematic of a CKRT circuit. I will not deal with it much here because we will be doing another talk on alarms and where I will be dealing with, with this. And so with that, I would like to say vascular access remains a challenge. I think we must put in adequate planning for vascular access. And we have now in our array newer membranes with middleweight uh, molecular weight cutoffs and increasing adsorptive capacities that may find increasing use in the future. Thank you very much.